My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. This week we are joined by the British author Luke Phillips to discuss Britain's ABC, that's Alien Big Cats if you don't know, phenomena, alongside more invasive species, cryptozoology and our mutual love of the horror author James Herbert. We cover several famous British big cat sightings and flaps so I've put a large selection of links to these stories in the show notes if you want to find out more about each particular case. We'll also discuss Luke's books, Shadow Beast and the Daughters of Darkness and what the rest of the year may hold for him. Which, going on current thing, probably means self-isolation for the next few weeks. As I record this, it seems that the awful news from Europe, which continues to suffer terrible losses from the coronavirus, just seems to get worse on a daily basis. Sadly, it also seems to have launched numerous conspiracy theories on the back of this. You know, because terrible events don't need speculation adding to it to make things and people feel better about themselves. Pandemics are nothing new, so quite why anyone would want to leap to incredible conspiracy theories rather than history showing us that these things happen baffles me. Just do your bit, stay in, wash your hands and just stay safe. And to my friends in Italy and our listeners, resta forte Italia. Also, my deepest condolences to the family and friends of British Fortian, Anthony Conroy, who sadly passed away recently. Anthony was a kind, caring and thoughtful man who will be deeply missed by all in the Fortean world here in Britain. Take care. Don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook by searching for Mysteries and Monsters. We're also on Twitter and Instagram as Mystery Monsters. You can support the show by making a donation via PayPal by searching for Mysteries and Monsters. And finally, you can always drop us a line via email at mysteriesandmonsters at gmail.com if you'd like to appear on the show or just drop us a line with a chat. So, as this crisis unfolds across the world, just try and focus what matters to you, stay safe and take care of each other. Now, it's time to speak to Luke Phillips for this week's episode. My guest today is British author Luke Phillips. Luke has always had an interest in natural history. It's hard to say when that interest began to include myths and monsters that haunt our folklore, but it may well have been as a young boy standing on the shores of Loch Ness. From trekking through California looking for Bigfoot, to camping out in the highlands on the trail of real-life reported big cats, his imagination has always been captivated by the darker side of our unnatural history. Despite studying zoology at university, Lucas strayed from the mainstream into the eerie world of cryptids and monsters and the truth may well be stranger and far scarier than fiction. His first book, Shadow Beast, was launched in 2015, and his second, The Daughters of Darkness, was released in 2017. Luke is based in Kent, in the UK. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Pleasure. It's it's always nice, especially um, because it's, it's always interesting when I speak to people that I've heard on other shows, because I feel like I know you a little bit already. No, well, as a, somebody who listens to the, the podcast, it, it, it's the same for me. I feel like I'm <laughs> speaking to somebody I already know. Um, and that's, again, that's the joy of social media as well, isn't it? You feel like you've, you've met everybody before. 
absolutely, very much so. I was I was saying to someone the other week uh, that that Shannon and into the fray is essentially a a gateway drug podcast. Absolutely, and into so many situations because I've met so many people or or found people that are that have a similar slant to my my thoughts in regards to cryptozoology and the paranormal through into the fray that it's it's just taken me in obviously you were on there uh, a couple of well, three years ago i think now lou was it yeah i think it was episode 92 so i don't know what episode that would have any you know oh. it's now but we're they're approaching 500 so it must have been yeah, yeah a couple of years ago now yeah. at least so yes yeah, so it would have been it would have been because it would have been 2017 so yeah because uh, yes. the, the, the cut the, the the second book had just come out so yeah but yes um the phrases as uh shannon calls them yes or calls, or calls us as such yes uh yeah i mean again it's great to actually connect with people who enjoy the topic and i don't mean you know the armchair sort of uh researchers or trolls or the you know that's mm. it's people who are actually just genuinely enjoying the, the 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 topic that's where you get all the you know the jokes the this the you know the sort of in-group sense of humor and i think as you say it's a gate gateway uh podcast for um everything to do with everything from the paranormal to um you know our, our beloved cryptids so Absolutely. And it's it's always intriguing for me as well, because I think yourself as an author, Luke, you, you certainly seem to um, be in a, a certain niche of cryptozoological fiction, um, though there is a large uh, influence, obviously, on your work by uh, our, our wonderful alleged population of ABCs. So what drew you towards this wonderful subject what was what was the reason that you got hooked well um it started out when i was at university i studied zoology at um university of, um, uh, of john moore's up in liverpool um and uh i basically started as most you know uh, sort of air quotes scientists do um by trying to prove that they weren't here mm. Um, cause I'd obviously heard the stories. Um, I lived in, um, Penge, Crystal Palace and Beckenham at the time. Ah. We'd had, a, we'd had our own, uh, scare story of the Penge Panther. Yes. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> which, you know, when you think about it, it's just like, you know, but it's the same with the Surrey Puma. Um, you know, all of these cats that have appeared in big built up areas, mm. you think what's there, but. Crystal Palace Park is, you know, um, a significant green space, yep. um, which has, you know, all sorts of prey species. And again, after you dismiss it and you start looking into it, you know, there was a police constable who was called to the main eyewitness of the Penge Panther. Mm. And he said, yeah, it was a big cat. You know, and it's very difficult to argue with a policeman and say, no, it can't have been, don't you? <laughs> it's, you know, they were adamant of what they had seen. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, yeah and, and again, once you start looking into it, so as I did at university, so for instance, there was a, a Gloucester, Gloucestershire Constabulary, and it's quite famous. I think it's, it's now done the rounds on all of the TV programs and YouTube mm. and things like that, uh, of uh, police helicopter footage who were... Uh, looking for an animal you know that had been reported on the m4 mm. and the the infrared footage clearly shows a lynx yeah you know it's a large long-legged feline with no tail mm. you know um you know and it's it's clear as day that it's not a blob squatch it's you can see exactly what it is mm. um, and then we've had uh again you start uncovering you know the facts um you know so for instance Felicity the Puma, which yes. was uh, found in 1980 in you know, Highlands of Canic, which is exactly where my first book is set for, yes. for that reason. Um, you know, there's been links, several links shot, um, livestock deaths. Um, mm. There's been, you know, I mean, there's over 2,000 sightings a year mm. of big cats in the UK. Now, I, a lot of them are mistaken identity. There's no. Yep. Yeah, uh, we've all seen the videos of what look like very large cats, and there is a feral cat population. And f people don't realise how big feral cats can be. Um, but two thousand, you know, sightings a year. It only takes one of them to be right, and mm. 
Uh, yeah, and I know that's a phrase that many investigators use, but 2,000 people a year cannot be lying, you know. Um, and when you talk to officials like the police, like, you know, um, you know, military personnel and things like that, who are confirming what these people are seeing, yeah. um, then you have to really start taking it a little bit more seriously and not dismissing it quite as much. And it's interesting because when I've mentioned what I do at work, for instance, you know, I work for a company where there's about 250 of us. Um, I mentioned what I do very casually. In that time, two people have come up to me and said, I've seen one. Mm. You know, so and that's, you know, in, in you know, as I say, in, in Kent in the Garden of England, which is a, a big cat hotspot. So, yeah, it basically started out as a, a little side project at university. Me think, well, this will be easy. I can put this to bed and, you know, prove that they're not here. Um, and uh, 23 years later. Uh... Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing as well. I mean, was there a point, Luke, when, you know, as you say, your your grounding is in in you know, the, the, the bricks and mortar of real zoology without wishing to dismiss, as, as I'm sure anybody who listens to the program, I certainly don't. I'm not dismissive of cryptozoology in the slightest. But was there a certain point when you just thought, I'm not too sure about some of these stories. There's there's a lot more to them. I, I think it took a lot. Well, there was, it took, I was always sceptical right up until I had an encounter, my, or I had two encounters myself, mm. um, which basically, you know, made me think, you know, well, what do you do about that? Because you're either just, you know, you're now in that situ situation that everybody else is in that, you know, do you question what you've seen or do you trust yourself and you know the first encounter i had um which was you know several years ago now um i was living in seven oaks in kent mm. um i was coming back from a friend's house in tunbridge um there is a very steep hill um quite close to the national trust property of knoll park yes. and knoll park is a very um, expansive um, deer park. They've got fallow deer there. They've got seeker deer. Um, you know, so you know, lovely, you know, huge territory. And basically, as I was coming back um, up this um, hill before it just gets to the property, uh, three deer ran across the road. Um, I absolutely slammed on the brakes mm. um, and went to get going again. And a very large black shape passed in front of the headlights mm. and immediately knew what i'd seen um you know it was a large black cat it had you know ears close to the skull uh it had a long tail that was using valances that streaked across it didn't care i was there it certainly avoided me it knew where the shadows were it had all of the it showed all of the instinctive behavior of a predator mm. uh you know, and I knew immediately what I'd seen. Mm. I questioned what I'd seen for a very long time. Um, but when I did phone the police and said, look, I'm just reporting this. Please don't. Dis you know, I was expecting a huge argument and some dismissive nonsense. Mm. Um, you know, um, and again, that particular cat about. For, well, I don't know if it was that particular cat, but three years later, we had a, a huge um, spat of sightings. Um, of what became known as the Null Park Panther, mm. uh, you know, and there were reported livestock deaths at, at the at Null Park uh, of deer. So, mm. um... I, I mean, I've long been intrigued by stories of ABCs in the United Kingdom. Um, primarily, most people outside of the UK are going to have heard of one more than any other, which is the Beast of Bodmin. Absolutely, yeah. Um, which always, despite having zero connection with, with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and um, the Hound of the Baskervilles, has always reminded me as a, as a wonderful potential uh, for a story about Sherlock Holmes as, as some kind of parallel sequel to the Hound. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, and there are, again, it's just that area of the country. It's the, uh, you know... The fact that it's probably the most famous one because of the amount of media attention it got. Mm. You know, this is a cat that we had the army out hunting. Yes. Um, free snipers said they saw it but couldn't get a shot off. Yes. You know, so you had you had validation of the reports. Um, you had livestock 
deaths. Um, you had one particular farm which was, you know, very badly affected by it. Um, and, you know, from, I think, you know, 78 to 81, um, th- this was an animal that was regularly in the media spotlight, you know. Um, and, a, you know, a, a significant amount of, you know, taxpayers' money went on trying to find the creatures, trying to find, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to hunt it down, basically. Um, and again, I think what's interesting is that, you know, um, researchers at the time identified, yes, a large black cat, but also then they found that there was a small, smaller, sandy coloured animal that regularly travelled with it. Um, and they uh, identified different footprints and things like that. And again, this is that's significant evidence. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, they, they, they were mistaken. It was a fox. Um, you know, when you've got people, um, you know, making those kind of clarifications and they're on public record, you know, that's, um, you know, something that you've got to start taking a bit more seriously. The most frustrating aspect of, of, of all of this for me, Luke, is, is that I know enough about this subject to know how many non-native cats have been shot and killed in this country in the last 40 years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it and I find it incredible that whenever one of these stories hits the news, uh, you know, we've touched on a couple. You've you've mentioned the one in Penge, you know, Gloucestershire's had had a flap, Cornwall's had a flap. There was a famous one in Sydenham where a bodybuilder got attacked in his garden. Yeah, exactly. And I and I think that guy was. I think again, obviously, when you look at Sydenham and how yes. close it is to Penge. Yep. You know. There's, I mean, and I, again, I lived in the area at the time, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're, I'm Beckham and born and bred. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was actual out, in fact, it's a really good example of why, if there is a conspiracy theory behind these animals, mm-hmm. the, how people reacted to that particular cat is a good example of why there might be one. Mm-hmm. Because I had people, I had local friends who were teachers, phoning up whether the school should be closed there was and in fact there was a local school that was closed you know um there were people you know uh keeping their pets in um there were you know people weren't going to go to the open air concert at crystal palace yeah you know and this was all um you know based on basically one sighting but again it was collaborated by the police they said Mm -hmm. they'd seen something in his garden um you know it's Again, it can't just be dismissed. It's you know, and again, and you know, and these you know, huge city parks like Crystal Palace Park, yeah. they they create you know, perfect corridors and gateways for mm. these animals to travel from. You know, there's a reason why, for instance, Munt Jack deer have invaded huge you know swathes of the uh, the countryside. Yeah. Um, because they've been able to travel through mainly railways, yeah. But all, but they've actually from the railways they've entered you know uh, city parks, yeah. Um, and and you know they, and that's an example of an invasive prey animal. Mm-hmm. Um, others include wild boar and you know and there's m- many others. Um, you know, uh, for, so if you had an ABC, if you have a, a new apex predator in the ecosystem, mm-hmm. it's going to follow the prey. Absolutely. I mean, it's I mean, the incident in Sydenham is one of my favourite reported ones, um, because, I mean, essentially, he ba- he had a fight with this creature for 30 seconds. We're not talking about somebody glancing and seeing something that ran through the bottom of the garden or anything. And I'm I've got friends from South East London, so I've, I've visited that area quite a lot over the last sort of 30 years, Luke. So I know just I think it's one of those things people just don't think other than the the main parts like Hyde Park. They're not aware of just how green and leafy some areas of of London are, especially in the southeast. And, you know, I I know Beckenham particularly well, because one of my one of my friends is from Charlton. So I know around that area very well. A friend of mine used to live in Sydenham. So all that kind of area um, around that kind of, you know, part of London. I know fairly well, and I know how green and lush certain areas are that. And it's, you know, London's London as well. When you come to the outskirts, after 11 o'clock, you don't really see many people. It's not like the inner city where it's hustle and bustle 24 hours a day. No, don't. And, you know, it's worth remembering, 47% of outer London is green space. Mm. And another 2.5% is water. Yeah. 
You know, so that you know, nearly fifty percent of our capital city is basically you know prime wildlife habitat. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, so yeah, it's a significant green space. There aren't actually many cities on earth like London when it comes to the green space it offers. We're also we're very wildlife orientated. There are lots of wildlife corridors. Um, and as you say, Sydenham has these huge avenues of tree-lined, uh, you know, um, Victorian roads. Mm. Uh, there's there's significant railways. There's you know with lots of tunnels. There's lots of you know if you were if you if you were a, a, an apex predator with you know a millennia of instincts, you could hide no problem. Mm. I mean, one of the strangest excuses I've I've ever heard to to completely dismiss the potential of any kind of big cat living in the UK was famously it was either too wet or too cold for big yeah. cats to survive in, <laughs> as if um, big cats only live in Africa and India. Um, and I just find that um, incredible. When the first thing that came to my mind was, well, have you never heard of a Siberian tiger? No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, what? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look at there are there are certain aspects of our environment that so certain animals like a, a lion or a, or a tiger, even mm. a Muir tiger or a Siberian tiger, you know, they would probably find our climate slightly difficult. Mm. But depending on what species they were, because as you say, there are uh, if it was a Muir tiger, which just happens to be the largest species cat in the world, yeah, they might they might be they might survive a little bit easier than a Sumatran or a Bengal. But mm. but if you look at the two types of cats that are regularly reported, so one being the black panther as such. So and obviously panther is a you know a, a generic term. Um, what we're actually referring to is a melanistic animal, you know, an animal that's got a black pigment skin. Mm. So probably a leopard. Um, it could also refer to a jaguar. Yep. Um, um, there's actually been studies of melanism in all cat species, and there is a potential that uh, just no matter what the species of cat, it's estimated that roughly one in ten thousand animals are probably going to be black, mm. unless there are population animals. So, for instance, there are uh, a population in Sri Lanka of leopards who are almost predominantly black. Yep. Because it suits their environment better. Mm. Um, and again, if you go to South America and you go to the Mato Grosso, um, there are there is a population there of jaguars which are predominantly black, mm. um, and they also seem to have shorter tails as well, which is interesting. Mm. Um, again, and it's an environmental adaptation. So, um, but what is interesting is that um, genetically speaking, black cats have better immune systems, yep. um, and they are much more likely to survive because obviously they're. Uh, much more likely to unlikely to be seen mm. they, they've got an advantage when hunting at night and, and and all of those sort of evolutionary benefits so it's no you know no surprise that black cats you know do well particularly um in the right environment but when you look at leopards and uh, you know so the black leopard and mountain lions um you know the sandy colored animals that are reported in the uk mm. we're talking about the two most uh, adaptive species of cat in the world. Mm. Le leopards are found right across from Europe, right you know, from you know, you know, literally you know, the same Siberian area of uh, uh, um, of Russia and mm. China, um, right across Europe to the um, uh, uh, you know, across Asia into Africa, yeah. um, into the Middle East. You know, leopards are found absolutely everywhere. And uh, when you look at the mountain lion, the mountain lion is found from Alaska right down to the tip of um, the Andes in South America. Yep. So, you know, we, there, there isn't an environment that those two cats cannot conquer. Yes. You know, uh, uh, and yeah, to, so to, to simply suggest that we, you know, who've got a fairly convenient mid-range um, uh, uh, climate and also we've got everything from mountain peaks to you know coastal brush and desert um you know we can accommodate a big cat very happily and it's also worth remembering that until very recently we did have native species of big cats mm -hmm. you know um up until 400 years ago we did have the lynx yep. um up until 10,000 years ago we had um you know 
quite serious big cats. We had Homotherium, which was a, a full saber tooth cat. We had yeah. uh, the European Jaguar. We had the you know, the European Leopard. We had cave lions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we you know we, over the years we've we've um, had some serious fauna. I mean, it's only relatively recently speaking ge geologically that we've lost them. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it is one of those things. And I think it's probably, especially when we're, we're talking about such subjects as, as mystery cryptids, that one of the most overly used quotes is, is nature will find a way. Oh, you know? yeah. And it, and it always does. And it, it still surprises me, Luke, that, you know, certain there are certain sceptical aspects to, towards nature that they... They completely disregard anything, and and I mean, all, you've only got to go to Florida to, to to understand that there's not a lot of places that if if a certain species can adapt quickly enough, they can survive almost anywhere. Well, exactly. I mean, Florida, which is a, a gateway into, the, <laughs> into America for the exotic pet trade. Yes. Um, you know, they have had so many different types of animal species escape particularly when they've been hit by hurricanes and flooding yeah you know but you know so you've now got all sorts of issues with you know everything from reticulated pythons to agama lizards to um you know types of um exotic bird and you name it. I mean, Florida really has, you know, got. I mean, we think we've got problems when it comes to invasive species like, you know, the grey squirrel and things like that. Florida is, as always, seems to be the case for Florida. Um, has, uh, you know, is is go big or go home. So, <laughs> yeah, they've they've absolutely won when it comes to invasive species problems and and not controlling them. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that once surprised me the most of, of, of strange animals that live in Florida is uh, the cane rat. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. If, if you've never seen, I mean, anybody that's that's afraid of, you know, mice and rats, normal ones, God knows what they'd think if they came across one of those. And I, I remember seeing some footage of a, like a, a group of them around bins and they were just enormous they are yeah i mean it's um <laughs> what again one of my favorite books is james herbert's the rat yes and, the first and, horror book i ever read i was uh, nine they, <laughs> i think i think they're, and they're yeah yeah there is a um a scene in my book that shadow beast which pays mm. homage to um the rats because there's a school scene basically yes. um yeah um and uh, yeah just because like you say i think it was probably one of the first horror monster books i read and yeah. i just was you know trying to fix it but when you when when they talk about the rats in you know the original rats that uh, the, you know the breed of found they were from sumatra and they were mm. basically what he was describing was a cane rat yes uh, you know um you know with these formidable incisors and mm. um yeah but yeah absolutely if you're scared of rats do not look up cane rats you are not um you won't be sleeping for a while <laughs> absolutely and there's also um peter jackson uh the wonderful new zealand film director his film um is it brain dead oh yeah with, with yes. the now that's isn't that from isn't that zombie rat from sumatra that, they are basically exactly <laughs> right yeah and i think and i'm not sure who he was homaging there whether he was homaging herbert or do you see what do you see where i'm coming from with that because it, exactly. it, it plays on two things that it does yeah yeah no it's interesting because it uh, well, given how old the rats is, I would say he. I would like to think he was, but mm. and and he, and he, I know Peter Jackson is a, is an uh, you know a, a, a prolific reader. So, um, but yeah, it could, it could have been him, or it could be Romero, or um, yeah, it's. But yeah, well, let's hope it's Herbert. So. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, wouldn't surprise me in the least. Um, no, um, I mean James Herbert is one of those um, who we sadly lost a, a couple of years ago. He's, he's did, I, yeah. I, for me, he's one of those authors that. I think he's not perhaps as well known as he should be, really, for a, for probably our most prolific modern horror writer. Oh, absolutely! I mean, he wrote some really stunning books. I mean, you know, as a, the 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 first two rats books, yes. um, you know, the rats and uh, Lair. Yeah. I particular, you know, Domain. I didn't get on quite so well because there. But again, you know, the zombies turn up in 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 Domain, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great books. And but Lair, which interestingly enough is set in a deer park, 
Mm. Uh, you know, um, again, it really captured the essence and the fear factor that, for instance, we see with big cats today. But, um, but and yeah, and he he wrote a beautiful fairy tale called Once. Yeah, um, which was lovely, but and Fluke, which I know got made into a movie, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, but yes, no, he, as you say, one of our best, you know, best writers, really, and yeah, as you say, not as famous as he deserves to, as he should be, really. Yeah, I, I think he suffers from in the vast majority of his work that he's had some really bad film versions, <laughs> and I think yeah. the only one that probably stands up to the fog. Oh, absolutely, yeah, the fog is terrific um but again i think it's something about the early 80s and horror movies mm. um you know that's when they were last doing them properly <laughs> and I, I know i know a lot of people get annoyed when i say that but you know there, there is something about the 80s you know the original 80s fog that is very good mm. um and again you know uh, uh as you say he has uh, unfortunately paid the price with some terrible uh movies of the books so yes especially rats oh yeah <laughs> Which uh, which I recommend both as as a horror completist and also a lover of really bad horror films. That, absolutely, I mean the the resemblance it bears to the book is, uh, <laughs> oh. is 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 laughable. But yes, it's got to be. It's got to. I mean, again, um, I think was it. Um, I can't remember one of the. I think it was twenty eight days later had mm. paid a, a little homage to because there was a a, a scene with. A tunnel and lots of rats and yes that was, that was a, a, a homage to james herbert so it's interesting but he's clearly influenced a lot of people in the field and it's just mm. a shame that um yeah for, for instance films like the rats have not has n- haven't haven't to date been done justice so yeah i think he's i think he struggled because king's had a lot of bad films yeah made from his work however two or three of the early ones were really rather good which are uh, carrie yeah, uh, and Christine, and I think that kind of lessens the damage of some of the later work, like you oh, know, absolutely, yeah. you know, Let's... like the Lawnmower Man bears no resemblance to the story Still. at all. Uh, <laughs> if you're talking yeah. about artistic license, Luke, that's one of the worst examples ever. Oh, it's terrible, and it, and, and it's, um, but then it, I mean, you know, you, you're talking about Christine there, because you know, as well as being a, a conservationist, I'm a, I'm a, a petrol head, which is slightly ironic, but you know, um, it, let, let's see what you can really do is one of the best scenes in cinema where Christine just builds herself in the garage. It's yeah. Just, yeah. But again, you know, Stephen King hated The Shining, and uh, but yes. yeah, he, uh, but it's it's now considered one of the icons of cinema, um, mm. and obviously with. The recent success King is seeing with it and um, you know Mr. Mercedes and things like that. Mm. Clearly, you know he's back back into it. Although, again, one of the films he doesn't like, which I, I actually think is hilarious, is uh, Silver Bullet. Yes, I love uh, Silver Bullet. I love yeah uh, yeah. It's what it's one of my absolute favourites. Yeah, you know, just just to see a, a werewolf clutching a, a baseball bat. <laughs> um, yeah. I, 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 I'll forgive it anything, really. So it's uh... absolutely it is it is it is one one of those films that really you can see the plot twist coming from about five minutes in. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> we're, we're not. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking um, one of the most um, uh, uh, literary uh, of of, uh, of of twists and storytelling, but um, it's it's enjoyable nonetheless for that reason. So yeah, yeah very much so. So was it? As you say, as we've as we've kind of digressed a little bit into our, mm. our mutual love of, of bad versions of, of our favourite <laughs> horror authors' films, um, <laughs> what was it that made you make make the leap from from studying big cats and 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 your your background in zoology, Luke, to to taking the leap to become an author? Then was it what was the catalyst in regards to that? Well, to a certain extent, it was you know um, talking about Stephen King. You know, there's um uh, uh, you know there was. Uh, a, a bit of a challenge that he wrote, you know, he he sort of threw down in, in one of his books on writing, which was, you know, um, it, it, if you can't find a book that you want to read, write it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that was very much what, you know, I, I just felt that when, you know, because I, I'd talked to so many witnesses, I'd talked to, you know, authority figures, I'd spoken to the police, um, I, you know, I'd contacted DEFRA, I'd, you know, spoken to people who'd seen them i'd been out on the moors you know um yeah talking about my second encounter you know um yeah i've been in dark 
Dartmoor, um, and we had you know played played sound recordings mm. uh, of a of a Puma, um, only to get something you know call back, um, and oh. and then we had. Uh, you know, the carnival keeper at Exmoor Zoo, mm. um, you know, confirmed to us. He said that he re- he had seen a leopard himself, mm. and that he said that the leopards that are at Exmoor Zoo regularly get, you know, how can you, I put it, courted or called mm. to, you know, um, from 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 outside the zoo. So, you know, what do you explain it? But basically, it get, got to the point where I thought. There's, there is a story to be told here. There is, um, um, I, I've, I'd always loved writing when, when I was at school. Uh, my English teachers encouraged me to write, um, but I was dead set on being a vet at the time. And when I didn't get the grades, I was then dead set on being a zoologist. Um, but I, to a certain extent, I think all these things happen for a reason. And if I hadn't gone to university and studied zoology, um, I would never have had the background that I now do to write the books. Mm. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have the knowledge. I wouldn't have done the research. I wouldn't have met the people that I have met in the in the industry or in the field. Um, you know, who have given me these incredible witness accounts, who have given me these stories, who feel happy to come up to me at talks and tell me that they've had an experience. Um, you know, not just with big cats. You know. Mm. Um, you know, uh, we, I've had everything reported to me from, you know, Bigfoot to, you know, um, people reporting dragons and fairies. So, yes. and, and, and uh, as I say, some of those I'm yet to be convinced on, but that doesn't mean um, I, I don't listen. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the thing. And, and whenever I've spoken to anybody that's started a career in, in either personal interest or professionally, um uh, when it deals with with cryptids is that they regardless of the subject they they tend to specialize in they they seem to find themselves attracting stories for as you touch on there some things that really push the boundaries of both credence and zoological knowledge yeah oh without a doubt i mean it's i think if you'd asked me 10 years ago you know luke do you think there's any chance of there being you know Big cats in the UK, I would have said yes, absolutely, not a problem. I believe in that. There's this reason. Mm. And if if that question had been followed up with what about Bigfoot, I would have probably dismissed it. Mm. Um, you know, and probably a little arrogantly. Mm. Um, uh, I don't think I would have. Uh, and again, if somebody had said what about werewolves, you know, one of my as as we mentioned, probably one of my favourite you know movie monsters. Yes. Again, I would have said. No, absolutely no chance. Surely these things don't exist. Mm. But, you know, a little bit later on, you know what? People are, in fact, you know, as I say, I, I live in Kent. I don't live too far from the village of Yalding, mm. which has had both Bigfoot and, um, you know, what we, you know, I hate the term, and I know Shannon hates the term, and I know yes. pretty much anyone who, who deals with them hates the term. But, you know, for, for want of another word, you know, has dog man has been reported so um you know um so um, and again you ca- I, I can't it's not fair of me to say that i'm happy to look into big big cats which most mm. people don't think are here mm. uh, and then dismiss people who say well actually what i saw was you know seven foot tall and looks a bit like an ape man or you know uh, a neanderthal or uh, a werewolf you know, mm. so. yeah i mean Dogman, as, as as the term that nobody seems to really like, um, <laughs> but then nobody wants to say werewolf either. I think Luke. I think no. you, you, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place with this it, it one. It does. It does. I mean, it's interesting because uh, when I've uh, yeah, I've done a little bit of research because I've got a, a book that is a work in progress that mm. is is yeah, where basically one of these creatures will make an appearance. Yeah, um, and trying to get native americans to talk about it you know i mean if you want to talk about people who take it seriously yes you know, the native american nations really really do because yeah. i i thought it can't be that because I, I didn't want to call it dog man i didn't want to call it this so i was like there must be a native american name i can use that will be um you know and it really is a a, a, a subject matter they're not really willing to trivialize at mm. all Mm-hmm. Um, and the moment I said I was working on fiction, 
they 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 were they were less interested because it was almost a, a, a they almost saw it as disrespect. Yes. So I'm working on some angles on that, but it was that was a really um, a real wake up call for me about how how serious some people take this. And obviously, you know, when you listen to you know Vic Cundiff's um, Dogman Encounters mm. and things like that, there are um, you know some. You know, clearly people are seeing something that, and as you say, some people are very, very clear on what they've seen. Mm. It can't be a case of mistaken identity. So, mm. and again, I think we've, uh, you know, I've mentioned to Shannon before, but there are there are aspects that get my scientific strokes, you know, my zoology brain interested. So, you know, for instance, when a, a lot of people, you know, when they mention this creature moving up from four uh, limbs to two so when it goes from being a quadruped to a biped mm. they, they talk about this popping of the joints or yeah. you know, this popping noise as it um as it stands up mm. now that's very unlikely to be bone because obviously that would be extremely um painful and yes so, but it sounds like a bit like when you crack your knuckles it's some kind of synaptic fluid popping mm. Um, as it sort of repositions, um, you know, uh, itself, which makes a lot of sense. But if you're making this stuff up, that's a very strange um, detail to to imagine. Mm. Yeah, and I've got a good imagination. Well, I hope yeah. I have because I'm a writer. So <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, but um, you know, for somebody to come up with that level of detail, mm. um, I think is very strange. And, I, and again, that lends it like, to me. It lends it a little bit of credibility because that is a biological process that they're describing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I've always thought that more people don't pick on about the Patterson-Gimlin film mm. because it's got breasts. Is uh, Absolutely. Right, and if you're going to make it up, who, 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 at what point does somebody say, I'll tell you what, this, I'll tell you what will convince everybody, let's give it breasts. Yeah, and not to mention <laughs> what looks like a hernia. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, not only is, I mean, this is the other thing as well when it comes to the Patterson Gimlin film as well is that people do not realize where in California that was shot and how inhospitable that environment was and uh, you know how difficult it was at the time to get to mm -hmm. you know there is a reason you know Patterson had to ask Bob Giblin uh, a a you know seasoned horseman you know, to get him in there because nothing else could get there, and it took three days as it was. Mm. Uh, you know, it was a, it's not just round the corner and off the trail. Yeah. Um, you know, that was deep woods at the time. Mm. Um, so the likelihood that they they got a you know a a, a big heavy suit up there, um, and then they thought, oh yeah, you know, do you know what? It needs breasts, and if you could make it look like it's got muscles moving under the skin and you've got a hernia mm. i mean as walt disney said at the time we couldn't do that and they yeah. were the best they were the best special effects <clears throat> studio in, of the late 60s and they said they couldn't do it yeah absolutely yeah. And, and and as i've always pointed out the other aspect of that is probably the most famous direct comparison is the year after plans of the apes was released and, absolutely. They, and they all look like people dressed up as monkeys yeah, and again, but it's even things like the compliant gate. You know, yes. they've. It's there are so many aspects of that film which just make you know, either they were basically geniuses, um, and I think if even if it was a hoax, there is absolutely no way Bob Gimlin was in on it. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, you know, Patterson. Yes, I know he had a bit of a background. Uh, and I know there was notebooks and things like that, but this was a guy who was genuinely looking for the animal. Mm. But but even if it was a hoax, and uh, which I don't think it was, um, you know, the amount of planning and, and, and basically genius level detail that would have gone into that, I just don't think Patterson was, was capable of that. And I, I don't mean that in a, a, a dismissive way. I just, mm. he, you know, he was a, a guy who was certainly out to make a buck, but... He, what, we're not talking about, uh, you know, um, an evil genius or anything, yeah. And and it just coming up with a whole different way of the animal walking, coming up with the details like breasts, coming up with that level, that a suit that good, hmm. you know. And I know um, 
who was the guy who said he was in the suit? Was it Horamus, Bob? Yes, yes. Yeah. The, the guy yeah. offered a hundred grand to pro- provide yeah. it, and he and yeah. he suddenly disappeared. He suddenly disappeared, and then when asked if he could find an evocation, couldn't get back to it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean you know, and uh, stuff like that gets sort of forgotten by history. And you, know, you talk to people about the passing given in film, and people go, "Oh, it's just a hoax, isn't it?" And you get, yeah. and you sort of let out this big sigh and go. Right, well, let me walk you through it. And so, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, as you say, there's these biological aspects of the film, biological aspects of the sightings mm. um, of, of a lot of these animals where you think, you know, and a lot of the time people, the people who are seeing them don't know a great deal about wildlife. Mm. So the likelihood of them picking up on these things or you know, making them up is very, very, very slim. Yeah. You, know, you need a lot of detailed knowledge to be able to, you know, come up with what they've described. Yeah, I think there are two two branches from from what you've said there, Luke, in regards to the Pats and Gimlin film, and I'll and I want to address both of them because mm. both of them, uh, I think, kind of answer certain um, allegations and and sceptical points to towards the the film and the people behind it. If they were that good at special effects. You know why? Why are they mucking about in the woods? These these guys could write their own checks in Hollywood. Right? Absolutely, they they could have gone to any studio at the time and shown, shown what they could have done, and they would have been yeah. made for the rest of their lives. Absolutely, Absolutely. Yeah. right. So that's that aspect. Because if, if I was that good, I know what I'd be doing. I wouldn't be running around the middle of Bluff Creek. No, of course. <laughs> not. And I know, and I wouldn't be going around to individual cinemas trying to sell the film for years and years and years afterwards yeah absolutely and the second aspect is is that people say well they're only in it for the money right are yeah. you honestly telling me that anybody who's searching for crypto a, a, a missing cryptid be it an <laughs> abominable snowman orang peng deck the yowie any of them do you think if if they can prove it they're going to give that research away for free or that proof for free of course they're mm. not you know, no. anybody who captures conclusive proof of any alleged cryptid, be it, you know, the, the thylacine, a prime example, anybody that finally produces something of that is set for the rest of their life. Oh, 100 percent. And I think and it, it's interesting because I think the thylacine is one of the animals we are much of all the ones we're, we've we might find i think the thylacine is the one that is yes, closest yeah you know, absolutely I, I do think that we are going to find populations in queensland and i think we're going to find populations in tasmania as well yeah. um you know and p- perhaps the two different subspecies you know the the larger and the smaller um i really do think that you know in our lifetime we are going to rediscover the thylacine so yeah absolutely i mean it's it's one of those i think it's you know it's iconic around the world as a as as an image of of both man's naivety and ignorance i think um you know essentially it, it was cleansing on a on a scale we probably aren't but it probably went on i mean i've seen pictures from from america and canada in the you know the late 19th century of some of the wolf slaughterings that went on and they are terrifying pictures where you've literally got hundreds of carcasses just piled up Oh, absolutely, and, and the um, uh, some of the things that were done in the, particularly in America in the nineteenth century, um, I mean, you've still got states today which have got bounties on certain predator skins, mm-hmm. um, and again, it's one of those things as a zoologist or uh, you know, as a conservationist that um, make my blood boil because mm-hmm. You know, the the arrogance that we show when we say stupid things like that, you know, wolves, for instance, are decimating the, 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 the deer population and things like that, you know, shows a fundamental disrespect and disregard mm. of predator prey relationships because uh, that's not how they work. You know, mm. um, predators decline with the deer. Yeah. Predators go up with the population increase of the deer yes. you, know, um, you know there is a, a harmony between predator and prey and mm-hmm. um, there always is there's only one animal and you know it's one of those interesting things that you know when a you know agent smith in the matrix d- describes you know the human human beings as a parasite mm-hmm. he's not far off because yeah. we are we are one of the only species in the um, sorry i'll get off my soapbox in a minute so right. is that uh, <laughs> yeah where, where, where uh, the, will 
willingly disregard um you know uh the abundance of prey um you know and you know there is only you know uh, um who wrote uh a whale for a killing that is a great naturalist i can't remember now um but they, he wrote a book on wolves and um he he, he basically was answering the accusations that wolves were killing all the caribou uh, and of course he went up into alaska he spent you know months on end studying them mm. and lo and behold the only things that were killing the caribou were men yeah you know it was uh and, we, and again we continue to do it it's um you know we are we, we wipe out all of our predators and then we wonder why ecosystems are out of kilt you know um in the way of the wolf which is one of my favorite books on conservation mm. it it's about the reintroduction of wolves into yellow yellowstone yes and there is a beautiful quote in it, which again I, I you know, I borrowed from, from one of my books, which is uh, he describes wolves as the painters of mountains, mm. which is, and what he means is what he goes on to describe is that basically the wolves, when they were reintroduced into Yellowstone, you had these very confident uh, deer and elk herds yeah. who could have spent, you know, the last few decades. Uh, browsing and eating whatever they like whenever they want mm. um, without have fear of being hunted and then suddenly with the introduction of the wolves um, they suddenly had to start taking on more natural um, prey behavior so mm. they could only eat at dawn and dusk they wouldn't go out in the open they yeah. would have to retreat to the tree line during the day and things mm. like that and suddenly wild flower meadows started popping up all over yellowstone um, when the you know, trees and shrubs were able to start growing around uh, waterways again, which then meant that beavers started coming back into Yellowstone. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is what we mean when we talk about an apex predator. Mm. Um, this is what we mean because they have complete control. They are keystone species that basically have this huge, um, important role to play in an ecosystem mm. they don't just eat your know, animals they're not a nuisance they actually are a way of controlling natural populations mm. and they do it way better than, than we do you know yeah. um, you know you and i for instance we both uh you know uh, live in areas where, where which have been affected by flooding mm. um, now how much flooding would we see if for instance beavers were more uh prominent in the uk Mm. You know, um, you know where where beavers have been reintroduced in Scotland and in the West Country, suddenly they're seeing less flooding. Yeah, you know, it, there are you know huge benefits to having um, a you know a natural and balanced ecosystem, mm. um, which has predators and prey. But in the UK, we did away with all of our apex predators um, a long time ago, yeah. um, and it's interesting that now we've got these um, ABCs that we're seeing you know perhaps a few things that um you know for instance yellowstone would would recognize so where we had you know huge spikes in the deer population we're seeing the numbers come down a little bit yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah it's interesting it is i mean it it is as well especially in the uk because you know for most people i don't think they're really aware of because you know, as we as we touched on earlier, Florida is is known around the world for the amount of invasive species that love living there, um, alongside all the tourists and the retirees. But um, you know, here in the UK, we've got three um, invasive species that, unless people saw them, I don't think you'd believe the unit. You know, we've got the 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 wallabies that have yep. made the way up and down the UK. I think there's a population in down south. There's one on the moors in North Yorkshire. And they're also on the Isle of Man. They are, yeah, Isle of Man. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's not, there's one not far, Hampshire, I think, has got yeah. a population of wallabies. Um, and again, they, they are spreading a little bit. But yeah, as you say, Yorkshire's got them. Um, I'm sure Chester had them as well. There's yeah. a, yeah, but yeah, yeah um, but when you think, oh, yeah, sorry, go on then. Paul. No, that's okay. I was going to say, you, you know, you've got those guys. You've got the, the hog population that's ripping up the Forest of Dean. Absolutely. And most of Kent. Yeah. So you've, you've, got, yeah. you've got, we've got, we've got Boar in Pembury, in Tunbridge, um, across Kent. I mean, 
I drove down the A21 not too long ago, mm-hmm. and uh, there is a, 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 a just south of Tunbridge Wells towards Hastings, there is a big patch between Tunbridge and Bed- Bedgebury, mm-hmm. and there is basically what looks like uh, a harvested field um, yes. along the uh, you know the road there and it's bore activity they've been digging up the you know the um, uh, the, the, the the soil there mm-hmm. uh, you know so yeah boar and again um, and you know you can't ask for a better prey species than wild boar yeah, yeah absolutely and my favorite weird invasive species is Norfolk's capybaras which I didn't even realise till a couple of years ago. I was like, "What? Where have they come from?" No, absolutely. <laughs> um, and again, uh, they they've now also been reported in in, in Gloucestershire. So yeah, uh, yeah, because they I think they were at the Cotswolds, um, what uh, Cotswolds Water Park or National, Water, and they they had escapees there. So yeah. um, you know, but we've got, I mean, yeah, those are our three sort of most interesting ones, but. Almost everything, you know, a lot of the animals we see every day are invasive species. So, mm. you know, the obvious one being the, you know, the North American grey squirrel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is an invasive species. Yeah. UK did never had any natural species of rabbits, um, you know, or, or hare. We had one species of hare, which was the mountain hare. Yeah. That's a, that's a native species. But the rabbit and the brown hare are invaders from Europe, which mm. both of which were brought over by the Normans and the Romans. So, yeah. Um, you know, uh, we've got yeah, we've got all sorts of things here if it shouldn't be here. So, yeah. oh, and obviously <laughs> uh, Chinese uh, water deer. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, um, near where I live in Sheffield, we've got a flourishing population of Chinese ducks. Right. Yeah. And they're um, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, when it comes to the, and it's interesting because obviously with global warming, we're now seeing other species like cattle egret come over. Mm. And, things like that um but yes uh, the amount of things that escape from parks and um uh you know that have escaped from collections um and things like that and that's the other thing as well that people don't you know when people are talking about the big cats and things yeah the amount of animals that are in private hands mm. even today you know you know the amount of people who are you know given licenses for you know basically dangerous animals mm. um you know is is you know is you know uh shocking really um I, I i don't know if i i think it was only a few years ago as well and this is the other thing is how they get here um you know and to give you an example um a few years ago i was um i was in portsmouth because i was i was going to go on a whale watching cruise in the bay of biscay but mm. um i was in portsmouth the evening before I was just having a walk around the jetty, um, and uh, and um, uh, I'd, I'd gone to see the um, um, the HMS Victory, um, and I was just walking around, and, and there was a guy walking his, you know, his what again air quotes dog, <laughs> yeah, and I and I just clapped eyes on it, and I went, you know, in my head, you know, the the uh, the, the you know the uh, narrator went, that's a timber wolf. Um, yeah, and I, and I was just, I was a bit sheepish. And I thought it can't be, and then, and I'm like, no, no, trust yourself. You know that's a timber wolf. So I walked over and, you know, made a bit of small talk because we were both looking up at, you know, HMS Victory and, yes. yeah. And I went, and I went. And he was actually an American chap, and um, mm. and I, and I, yeah, made polite small talk. And I, went, I went, I've got to ask. I said, you, you've got a timber wolf, and, and he went. And he was, he denied it a couple of times. I went, mm. look, I'm really sorry. I said, you know, I studied zoology at university. <laughs> I, you know, I know my animals, particularly mammals. Um, I said, it's a wolf. And he, and he chuckled and he went, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah it is a wolf. Um, but he got it in through Heathrow, listed as a German shepherd. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he bought it in America as a pet. Yeah. You know, kept it as a pet. Yeah, because obviously in America, you, you know, depending on the states, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, came over here, um, you know, and brought it with him. Yeah. Um, and he said, and I, you know, and I obviously asked you know, the question. I said, well, you know, is he friendly? Does he like to be stroked? And she said, well, likes an interesting word. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> tolerate. Yeah, but, yeah, that's exactly how he put it. He said, it tolerate. He tolerates it. I went, all right. Well, I'll risk it then. You know, yeah. but. But I mean, and again, it was interesting because 
as I walked over to him, you know, this, the, you know, the fact that it was a German Shepherd was just nonsense because, yeah. you know, this thing clocked me with amber eyes. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you know, when I started up, you know, many years ago, as a, a, I was uh, when I studied for my A levels, I worked as a veterinary nurse, and I was lucky enough to um, do some volunteering work up at the um, Metropolitan Police Dog School. Yes. So. I'm very familiar with German shepherds. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't like, and they don't have amber eyes that give you the chills as you mm. walk across the courtyard towards them. They're, um, you know, that's that's something you get when you are in, you know, again, it's uh, sort of that natural instinct that sort of that you get when you're when you're in the presence of a predator. You know? mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, nothing surprises me. I, I once went away golfing, and we went out at on on the saturday evening and uh, i met a couple with a with a pet raccoon right yeah um, you know in at the british seaside who loved uh real ale and pork scratchings wow okay and he was very yeah. nice very friendly yeah. hand fed him had a stroke and a tickle gorgeous yeah. but again <laughs> um they were they were relatively popular pets and again yeah. when we talk about invasions of species germany now has quite yes. a significant problem berlin especially it's, doesn't it with with uh, yeah with with raccoons um and uh it's interesting i've i've had several reports um from the town of rye which is down on the coast here um where they've had people saying they've seen raccoons now, <laughs> and i don't know if they're raccoons or they're raccoon dogs yes that have maybe escaped or or or, or you know otherwise mm. um but you know people are, are reporting raccoons so yeah, and once again, another another hardy species that's very adaptable. Absolutely, uh, you know, they live in forests or towns. Again, yeah, um, uh, right up and down, you know, the United States, um, you know, they are a, a very um, adaptable mm. animal, and one that, as Berlin proves, gets on very well in the urban environments. So. Absolutely, I remember um, I went to Florida um, two thousand and four. And we were we were staying out, out outside the uh, outside of Orlando in a complex. So we used to we used to be out most of the day, and we'd we'd stop off for food somewhere and just be stunned at how cheap everything was. And um, I remember we used to get back about eleven o'clock at night, so it was just you know it was fairly dark. There was still a bit of twilight kicking about, and the whole area would be littered with raccoons everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. You know, you could probably count in half a mile from turning off and driving to the to the villa. I'd probably say fifty or sixty. I saw. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I'm not surprised at all. Um, and again, when I was in California, um, by far and away the most common animal I saw it was yeah. If it wasn't raccoons, it was chipmunks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I was doing a, a road trip right up. Um, the, the, the coast of uh, 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 California um, and pretty much I would regularly stop at a picnic stop um, or pull in I you know sit down grab my lunch um, and you know within within normally within a few minutes and it happened and the, and the further north I went the more common it was um, I would be joined by chipmunks and raccoons who were you know quite intent on taking the lunch you mm. know um, but we, yeah, so I, I have no trouble. Um, uh, again, they're one of those animals that just acclimatise. They lose their fear of, um, you know, they habituate to people very, very quickly. Mm. Uh, and again, they've got the brain size, and they've got, um, you know, um, they've got the uh, the equipment in terms of uh, their paws and yes. to to get into all sorts of trouble and make the most of opportunities. So. <laughs> Absolutely, they are like. Um cheeky drunk nephews i think oh absolutely they're, yeah. they're just they're very cute they're very strange but they're they're deceivingly clever i think oh absolutely i mean like the um the uh, you know uh the idea of them being you know um uh, i mean i i know that in america they're they're fondly called trash pandas but, yes uh, <laughs> that's a wonderful uh, name uh, you know which is fantastic <laughs> you know um uh, you know, uh, but yeah, they are. They're mystery monkeys, and but again, it's that uh, that you know 
that cunning that we see in you know um because they're an offshoot of the of the weasel family you know mm. so, so you know badgers otters um wolverines that sort of stuff um you know they're all very very clever animals and and they have to be they you know they're inquisitive um they're problem solvers um you know uh and it's interesting so if they were able to make their way into the wild um, like so many of these animals have, would they survive? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it comes down to, you know, with ABCs, you know, people talk about, you know, 1976 and the Dangerous Wild Animals Act being yes. when it all started. You know, it wasn't. We, you know, we had circuses and traveling um, shows in the 1800s. We had. Uh, you know, traveling shows in the 15th, 16th, and century, you know, 15th, 16th, and 17th century. We had the Romans bring animals here, um, you know, and, you know, we get escapees today in the, you know, in the 2000s. Um, if you're telling me that they didn't have escapees in the, you know, in the, you know, um, in the, you know, you know, a thousand years ago and yes. four, five hundred, six hundred years ago, um, they absolutely did. And, you know, there are, reports you know right back to the 15th century of spotted leopards in the english countryside yeah you know, um you know and you know you've got to ask yourself where those animals came from um so it, you know this all started a long long time ago um you know um you know it wasn't just 1976 um it, yeah that 100% had a massive um you know, impact. There was, without a doubt, a huge population surge at the time, mm-hmm. which I imagine is why we are seeing as many sightings and reportings as we are today. Mm-hmm. But they haven't just been here for the last, uh, you know, forty years. They've been here, you know, for centuries. So. Yeah, I mean, there was a very famous incident at the beginning of the twentieth century where there was a uh, reports of wild, wild, uh, wildlife livestock. Um, being killed sheep primarily sheep and goats um, and that ended up being a Canadian lynx yeah and nobody knew where that come they assumed it was a pet but nobody came forward nobody could prove it was a pet and it was it was devastating local livestock and that was 1903 no, I think that's exactly right and again there were two shot in Scotland yeah um, you know um, in the 1970s and again they had they presumed they were pets Felicity the Puma was presumed to be a pet mm. because, because she was very tame and she got on. She yes. didn't seem to be scared of people. But and again, the lynx were assumed to be pets. Yes. And the fact that there was livestock killings suggests that probably was the case because mm. um, animals that aren't used to hunting prey do tend to go for livestock. Mm. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, but again, there was no proof. Nobody ever came forward. Um uh, yeah, and it's it's worth pointing out. You know, it, it wasn't until 1981 that it actually became uh, illegal to release um, <laughs> animals into the wild. You know? <laughs> yeah, so they part in 1976. They exactly. The Dangerous Wild Animals <laughs> Act, but they didn't bother making it illegal to release a, a, a dangerous <laughs> wild animal until 1981. Um, yeah, so. So you wouldn't have even if you did have a lion and let it loose on the you know you wouldn't have been gotten into trouble you know and, yeah. unless it was 1981 or beyond it's uh, you know it makes a mockery of it really it's uh, you know uh, I mean when you think about it it's it's well other you know you la- it, we laugh but it, it's terrifying when you think you know uh, and again one of the again one of the reasons that i write fiction is because so many you hear so many wonderful stories which you can't um you know get, um substantiate or or, or prove mm. but you know the stories of you know these you know rich personal collectors who you know that you know when they went down you know when the inspectors went downstairs and found all the cages empty and open <laughs> you know oh just you know absolute delight i was like yeah yeah that's the sort of um stuff story you know story dreams are made of you know but um uh, but again the people there we know that there were you know these animals were being bought you know regularly from shops like harrods yes and they were <laughs> being walked in the streets you know um you know there's everything from a guy who bought a line you know to keep his um 
uh, you know, his, uh, his uh, scrap metal business safe. Yep. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, to, you know, the, the line from Harrods, which was, uh, you know, a famous story. Um, Wonderful story. That's it very, it's lovely. a tearjerker. Christian the Lion, it's beautiful. It is. And again, it shows that, and it, it does show that the, the intelligence, the emotional uh, intelligence that these animals have, mm. um, you know, which does lend, a, uh, yeah, does play a part in whether they would be likely to survive or not, because it, they have the, you know, they have the brain matter that allows them to to live and adapt and, um, you know, form friendships, form alliances, mm. that sort of thing. Which is, you know, there's there's a reason why, for instance, going back to the Beast of Bodmin, two species of cat that you know were probably, you know, working together. You know, probably in, in all likelihood there was a puma and a leopard, um, hunting together. Um, mm. probably relatively soon after being released i suspect but mm. well absolutely we you know we we see it time and again that there is this kind of relationship interspecies relationships which which often defies belief and we've seen it on every continent involving every species i think luke yeah um well i think uh, i can't remember which one it was but there was there was a recent i'm just trying to look it up here um because i made a note there was i think it was the the stroud deer eater which was a great name for a cat Uh, (laughs) brilliant uh, yeah where they did dna um testing on it now the the bbc were involved oh yes yes and yeah and it's it's one of those conspiracy stories which um you know i'll repeat here because why not it's entertaining but again it's difficult to find the proof but so the the story goes that the bbc were really interested in it um they uh did testing in the uk um and it came back as dog yeah yeah they said it was dog attack now what for me what's interesting about that particular kill is that it shows absolutely no signs of a dog attack Mm. and every aspect of that carcass was um you know basically the um the stomach had been opened up the rib bones had been sheared through in a straight line um so snipped through by the carnassial teeth of the cat yeah um like so basically when when you look at a cat kill it's very clean mm. um and it almost looks like a scissor cut yeah um because they basically don't have any um, you know, molars or primos or incisors to, to do the hard work. So when a cat eats, it literally cuts off chunks and swallows. Hmm. They don't chew their food. Um, you know, they cut off these lumps of food. Um, but one of the things that cats do love to do, because they've got the dentition to do it, is they will break into bones and they will, you know, feast on the marrow. They love mm. marrow bone. Um, so, uh, but what you'll see is these very neat, you know, it looks like somebody's gone through the rib cage with, a, a, you know, a, a, a cutting shears. Mm. Um, and that's exactly what the, the Stroud deer eater looked like. And then the flip side of that is if you've ever seen livestock, and I've seen plenty of livestock that, you know, that has been attacked by dogs. Yeah. Um, dogs and bears in particular eat on the go. Yeah. So they don't care about you being undead, um, and they certainly don't care about table manners. So you're normally looking at very, very mutilated carcasses. You're normally looking at very messy kills, yeah. literally torn to pieces. That is the, you know, the typical um, uh, dog or bear kill. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, the, you know, the difference between that and a cat kill are normally very, very obvious, and the the, the Stroud deer eater as such that that, that Stroud deer carcass that showed no signs of of, of being fed on by dogs, mm. but the you know, the official thing came back by canine. Now what's interesting is allegedly further samples were then sent to a lab in in the Netherlands, mm. um, and they came back suggesting that it was a hybridised cat. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, and again, obviously, when you think about the potential population of these cats in the UK, um, the likelihood is that we are looking at hybridization because, um, the, you know, there, there just isn't there, there just wouldn't be enough animals for there to be a separate population of melanistic leopards and a separate population of um, 
of pumas and a separate population of jungle cats or mm. you know, whatever you want it you know, whatever it is. Um, so the likelihood that there is hybridization going on um, is very, very strong. So it's interesting when you get these reports of these relatively strange looking animals. So there's been reports in Cambridgeshire of basically what look like giant house cats, mm. um, but they have all of the movement and hallmarks of a big cat. Mm. But you know, and if you introduced hybridization into the conspiracy, then obviously that could explain a lot of the things that people see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because even even on a domestic cat level, servals have become quite popular as, as luxury pets. Yeah. And savannah cats, you know, which are only one sat, you know, one crossbreed down from a, a wild serval yes um you know uh, and and if you meet a generation one savannah cat they are they are basically servals mm. um you know um you know uh, they they retain a great deal of their wild behavior um they they're very playful they want to hunt they want to jump um you know i've i've you know spent time with gen, you know generation one um, uh, savannah cats and you know they're, they're, they're I mean personally I don't think they should be pets but mm. it, it's yeah because again I don't see any difference between that and keeping a serval but um, I'm sure you know there are savannah cat owners up and down the country in uproar um, but but you know again cats are, are one of those things you know it's like you know cats are responsible for you know um, you know, 300 million wildlife deaths a year. So the one thing we don't need to introduce is, is you know, one that's even better at killing, you know, um, you know animals and particularly birds and, 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 and small, small rodents. But, um, yeah. but yeah, our, our, but again, it, you know, it's the 2020s and we, we still haven't learned. We still want, you know, designer animals um, yeah. um, based on wildlife, you know, so. It is, it is a fascinating thing. I don't know whether it's some kind of, primeval throwback that we have to try and domesticate new species of wild animals to some kind of you know i've seen people around the world who have kept some of the most terrifying animals as as pets i know there are several people that keep alligators as pets and pet them and, yeah. and I, you know you know this I, i'm in awe of all that i think animals are incredible but i would not I don't care if I raised it from from a hatchling. There is no way on God's earth I'd ever consider an alligator to no, even I mean, be anything close to be, knowing what domesticity is. Oh no, and, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, it, uh, when it comes to reptiles and things like that, it, I, yeah, I just don't get it uh, because there is that predatory instinct, um, but also the, the you know the kinship that we form with a mammal. Mm. for instance you know that um you know that aspect of companionship uh, of uh, enjoying company and things like that um it's very hard to say if the reptile brain is is equipped for that mm. um and you know I, I would suggest that it isn't mm. um you know um it's only something we've really seen in higher mammals Mm -hmm. um you know um so uh and, and given the reptilian brain is is very different um mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that they have those that, that they can feel those same things that they can put, they can see us as anything other than a potential meal you know yeah. yeah i mean i mean you know i've i've had the privilege of of looking after reptiles over the years and you know bearded dragons are a yeah a, 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 you know a, a very um inquisitive creature um, but I wouldn't want to put my finger in its mouth, despite the fact that it, it liked to sit on me and have its tummy tickled. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and obviously, and obviously, I, I'm, I'm not dismissive because I know there are many, for instance, snake owners. But again, mm, yeah. we can't, we can't, we can't misinterpret inquisitiveness and curiosity. Plus, you know, I hate to say it, we're a warm-blooded animal, yes. um, so. <laughs> So they like us because we give off heat. Yes. Um, you know, and we tend to feed them. Yes. Um, you know, so there is that aspect of it. Mm. Um, but to, um, you know, to suggest that it's anything more than that, 
kind of goes against the biology, but I'm, I'm not going to fight it. I wouldn't say that, you know, but yeah, I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't be cuddling up with an alligator or uh, a particularly large python or, 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 or anything like that anytime soon. So. Yeah, yeah. Or a Komodo dragon for that matter. No, thank you. No, <laughs> no, yeah. again, but again, it shows what we, we now know because, you know, um, in the, you know, uh, uh, up until I think, the very late 1800s, it might even be into the 1900s, mm. um, you could you know, allow your small child to pet a Komodo dragon at London Zoo. Yes. You know, um, and that was before we understood, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, that they had venom, that they had, uh, you know, this deadly bite um, and, and all of that. So, um, but yeah, again, what we now know doesn't seem to have... Um, made a huge difference when it comes to some of the things we choose as pets so <laughs> very 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 true um but you know it, it'd be a dull world without that kind of <laughs> oh, it was. I mean, eccentric it's... especially in britain it's it, it we often come across I, I remember a very famous video a few years ago of a gentleman in scotland taking his emu for a walk yep and i <laughs> I, I still, and it astounds me, and I love it when, you know, no matter where you go, or you, as I say, like coming across a wolf in Portsmouth Harbour, or um, yeah, an emu in Inverness, or, or whatever it is, you know, um, you know, that sooner or later, you will bump into somebody who has got something, you know, that they basically see as no different as a Labrador, but will quite happily kill you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very true. Uh, we, especially we had the um, uh, tragic death of that gentleman in was it Florida last year with with a was it a pet cassowary? Oh yes, that was that Florida. I'm that's, not sure it was. Florida. was it, yeah, I know of the case, but I mean, I, I'm all, I, yeah. I mean, Shannon will be laughing, but yeah. That, oh oh oh, was it Florida? What a surprise! You know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, yeah, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, cassowary. I mean, again, people, you know, we we joke, but you know, these are these are significant, you know, and dangerous animals, and they don't know any difference. And I I, I know I'm basically sounding a bit like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park now, but you know, it's you know, nature doesn't understand that it's meant to be a pet or it's meant to be, um, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, domesticated, because you know, you've got in some cases millions of years of instinct you know um mm. you yeah, know it's, it's one of the reasons i chose big cats in the book as as my sort of animal villain as such because you know uh, when you go back to the our earliest ancestors you know that animal that they were scared of coming out of the out of the darkness at them the one that they drove the one that they drew on the cave paint on the cave walls and things like that was the big cat mm. you know um, and in particular leopards which are um you know um very adapt uh, adept um primate killers you know um yes. I, I think it's there's the, uh, the one of the lower uh mountain gorilla populations mm. nearly 30 percent of them are taken by leopards yeah yeah um and uh one of our yeah. earliest fossil sites um, which was in in, in North Africa, um, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, th th it was found in a cave where there were leopard fossils. And, you know, uh, again, in the second book, uh, it, the, Daughters the, the Daughters of the Darkness, I, I, I you know, I, I, I suggest, you know, or don't suggest, but you know, I mention it because it's based on fact is that, you know, that, that there were these human skulls and not far away from it was this, leopard skull mm. and the you know the killing blow to the to the human skulls was the leopard's tooth which fit perfectly into it you know yeah. um so we've we've had this um relationship with big cats for millennia um yeah. and they've always you know whereas you know to a certain extent wolves came and and sat with us by the fire there was always something the other side of the fire we were scared of, and mm. a lot of the time it was big cats. Yeah, I mean leopards are are, are ferocious hunters. I've seen a, I've seen a leopard take down a, a crocodile. Oh yeah, yeah, um, with, with and, ease, and it's, yeah. it's incredible. And jaguars in, in in South America, you know, regularly hunting black caiman. Yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, and 
you know, you know, seriously, you know, making, you know, and again, they're, they're killing by, you know, Jaguars, they like to, um, you know, they like to latch onto the back of the skull and put mm. their fangs through the top of the skull. And when you're doing that through um, a, a reptile's reptile hide and a skull, yep. um, you know, you need serious biting power to do that. You know, it's, um... Absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, it's one of the other things as well. They're, they're so adept and they're so quick. Um, I, I once remember watching a, a documentary about the urbanisation problem of leopards in India uh, yeah, as, the, as well, the cities came out and it was there were some horrific it's one of those documentaries where you know I've got a fairly strong stomach but it's one of them where I wish they'd have just said please be aware there will be upsetting scenes in this video because yeah. the, it, the amount of CCTV footage of leopards coming in and taking domestic pets dogs oh, especially dogs it especially. was unbelievable and the dogs were running for their lives because they knew they didn't stand a chance and it was like off camera and then next thing leopard comes past dragging the dog in its mouth Oh yeah, I mean, Done. I think some of, some of the ones as well, which um, which you now see where leopards are entering, for instance, hotel lobbies, yes, and taking sleeping dogs, you know, um, and things like that uh, are you know really quite brutal. And it's one of the things that always gets my attention is that if you're you know if I you know again you know the books are based on on reality because. The moment people start reporting missing animals in an area, yep. it, got, it gets my, you know, oh, have you seen this dog? Have you seen this cat? You know, um, it gets my attention because, mm. you know, there is there that we, as you say, New Delhi in particular has this really significant, um, you know, leopard problem where they're coming in and again they're they're taking domestic dogs, but also wild dogs and feral dogs because they've got such huge populations of these you know these these feral dogs that it it, it makes you know they're, they're easy pickings yeah very much so it's, but, but then again it's that balance isn't it it's all about encroachment and you know where do you draw the line oh absolutely i mean and again you know uh, just to, again to show the urbanization of the of the leopard um the you know, uh Johannesburg, you know, had a, a problem leopard. Yes. You know, as in, you know, one animal. So they set eight traps up for it um, across the city, and they caught eight leopards. You know, uh, and uh, they which they didn't know were there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, which makes you ask the question: Well, how many more are there? Exactly. <laughs> well, they've got the eight yeah. stupid ones. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, they caught the eight. Absolutely, they caught the eight stupid ones. Um, yeah, uh, so you've got to ask yourselves. Yeah, you know, when people say, "Oh well, we wouldn't if they were here, we would have seen one." Mm. Yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, yeah, and I'll quote my own book of it as a, you could walk right past one, and if it, it would only know, you would only know it was there if it wanted you to. And you know, unfortunately, believe me, you do not want it to. <laughs> it's, yeah, they are. They, 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 it is exactly what they do. They are ambush predators. Um, they've been doing it for you know far longer than the human you know species has been around, and they'll be doing it for a lot longer. So, absolutely. Well, listen. Just before I I, I, I wrap this fascinating and extremely interesting conversation up, so thank you again for your time. I just want to finish on on probably the 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 one abc story from the uk that that basically convinced me there's something there um which was in 1991 a eurasian lynx was shot and killed near norwich in norfolk and it had killed 15 sheep within the previous two weeks the story only came to light in 2003 and the alleged stuffed body is now supposedly owned by a collector for many years this incident was considered to have been a hoax particularly by the hunting community, but was confirmed by Norfolk Constabulary as a real incident in March 2006. They believe, but cannot prove, that it was an escapee from a nearby animal facility that bred animals. Mm. So that absolutely. was 14 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's a species that um, yeah, we are currently trying to see reintroduced into the uk yes um you know uh, uh you know we've hinted already in our chat that you know we we don't have any apex predators in the uk um officially uh, <laughs> yes uh, you know, uh, you know, um 
so yeah and so there is this um campaign to bring the lynx back to help control the deer population yep. um and to have an aspect of you know a, a balanced ecosystem but when you come across you know as you say so that is a perfect example of an animal that used to be hit here used to be found it within our ecosystem quite very easily fits into it um was denied for several years mm-hmm. um was used for political propaganda um, by both sides of the argument um only to basically once the furore had died down to be confirmed as something that did happen that was real mm-hmm. um, that was never confirmed to be a domestic animal yeah um and has basically just been again you know and you know the conspiracy theorists will love it but has basically been you know um um you know um brushed under the carpet again so yeah i mean that my biggest theory about all that is that i i i think that they just can't admit to it happening because you're going to have one of two things it's either going to cause lots of panic or you're just going to get groups of idiots tramping through woods and <laughs> across dangerous parts of the country uh, such as Dartmoor and Exmoor and North Yorkshire Moors and, and places where, the, you know, the, there are things such as quicksand and, and large yeah. crevasses that, you know, uh, Steve and his mates go out on the weekend, month, you know, big cat hunting and end up killing themselves by falling down a ravine loop. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think, I, I really do think that I've heard enough from farmers especially that they believe, they know what a dog attack looks like and up and down the UK, there are, there is something taking these animals that is not a dog. Oh no! And again, it's it tends to be, and again, to a certain extent, in the UK, farmers are vilified. Yes. Um, and they're made out to be this, you know, sort of the, you know, either money grabbing or the, you know, they're, um, you know, bigots who are set in their ways. But actually, yep. you know, the vast majority of farmers I speak to, they're wildlife orientated, they're conservation orientated. Um, they tend to be, um, they tend to know their animals, they tend to know their wildlife. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they're, uh, they're very aware that there are things afoot that, do not make sense Hmm. um and as you say they know what a dog attack looks like they'll report a dog attack and in fact actually most of them will quite happily shoot a dog yes um you know um because it it really is their livelihood at stake Mm -hmm. Um, but actually what what does show them are these attacks that happen at night normally in absolute silence um you know um and normally you know they only know about it when they discover the animal Yes. Um, and we're talking about numerous incidents where you've had animals, you know, sheep, you know, large animals found in trees, yep. um, partially buried like pumas do. So they've had their territory marked. They've been covered by brush. Um, mm. And again, they just don't meet the criteria of a, of a, of a dog attack. Um, and again, normally dogs are, vet, you know, as you've seen on any wildlife documentary, when dogs are on the hunt, particularly a feral pack of dogs, mm. they are extremely vocal. Yes. Um, and they, you normally know about it. Whereas a lot of these animals are discovered, um, you know, so, you know, one of our, you know, the local um, sort of uh, legends as such around here is the Beast of Blue Water, mm. um, which is, uh, you know, a, a large leopard, which is regularly seen um, anywhere from Gravesend to, you know, the grounds of the shopping centre, mm. where hence the beast of blue water. Yes. But uh, in Gravesend, um, not too long ago, in November 2019, um, a foal was attacked and killed. Mm. Um, you know, um, and there have been, you know, several uh, livestock killings where which show um, signs of asphyx- asphyxiation. So yes. they've got bulging eyes. They've got their tongue out. Um, you know. Uh, as I say, carcasses found in trees. You know, no dog in the world is going to drag, a, 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 you know, a, a, a anything up a tree. It just isn't. Um, you know, that's cat behaviour. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of the time, farmers know exactly what they're talking about. Um, and again, if you talk to the police and things like that, who are talking to these people regularly, yeah. um, they take it seriously as well. And, mm-hmm. and and again, that's a, a sign that maybe we should, or certainly should, start taking it seriously. So.
Very much so. Well, listen, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been brilliant to talk to you at last, Luke. We've, we've, we've spoken lots socially online, so it's finally nice to have a proper conversation with you. Um, it is indeed. <laughs> where can everybody keep up to date with your work and uh, what else is on your agenda for this year? Yeah, so, well, I'm, uh, I, I, you can find me on all the social channels, so Facebook um, and Instagram in particular. Uh, if you look for Black Beast Books, you'll find me. If you look for Luke Phillips, you'll also find me on Instagram and Twitter uh, and Facebook. But Black Beast Books is what I tend to go under, um, yeah, and you'll see more, most activity there. Um, I've got a blog, which is um, blackbeastsandboogiemen.com. Um, so you'll see some of our more interesting um, myths and legends on there from the big grey man and, you know, to, you know, the big cats um, discussed on there. Um, the two books, uh, Shadow Beast and The Daughters of the Darkness, uh, you can find on Amazon um, and Audible, um, either as a paperback uh, or an ebook, or, as I say, as, as an audio book. Um, and in terms of um, what's coming out there this year, I'm hoping to get book three out, mm -hmm. which is called Phantom Beast. Um, and my American readers will be very glad to hear that that is set in the, in, in America, in Wyoming. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, so a bit more globe trotting for, for Thomas Walker, my character. Um, there is also a, a character in that book for, called uh, Nina Lee who gets her own book um, which is called Rogue um, and I'm hoping to get that out as well by the end of the year mm -hmm. um, and that will be my first foray into um, Bigfoot territory so marvellous busy year ahead then sir it does absolutely yeah I've got, I've got to get writing so yeah all right okay well I'll not keep you any longer <laughs> <laughs> <Very kind. laughs> well listen thanks again for your time today it's been lovely to finally have a proper chat with you all the very best and uh, keep yourself grounded through what sounds a very year to, busy year to come, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, hearing many more episodes. You're very welcome. Take care. Thank you, Paul.